Well, let's open with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for another week and another night. We thank you that we can come together and just try and think through uh, just how, how it is that we interact with uh, homosexuals and just people in general, um, especially in light of what we've seen with Israel in the news recently. We pray that you would just give us much wisdom. We ask that you would help us to find a way forward that would be both truthful and yet loving and gracious. We seek to be faithful to you. And so we gather here this evening. Would you guide our conversations and our speech? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as, as per usual, for those who haven't been here before, it's open discussion night. So the idea is not me talking the whole time. Uh, you get to hear me do that enough of the time. So hopefully this is an opportunity for all of us to say some stuff. The the main sort of topic we're talking around is not so much Israel Folau, like that could fill the whole evening um, with everything that's happened. But he, I guess his predicament's more of sort of a launch pad into the issue of specifically how do we interact with the, the issue of homosexuality. Um, and so the direction we're going to go is we're going to have a look at sort of where it all started from for Israel. Um, and then move forward from there. So it all started with a tweet, and this was attached to a picture, and in the picture it sort of it showed God's plan, and it was sort of like showed a couple of pictures of God's plan. And someone said in the top box, what was God's plan for gay people? And he responded, hell, unless they repent of their sins and turn to God. So that's, that's where it all started. Uh, and from there, he instantly started getting some pretty severe flack. And one of his responses is on the left there, when, when asked about why he said that. And he said, my response to the question is what I believe God's plan is for all sinners, according to my understanding of my Bible teachings, specifically 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, which we will see later. So we won't bother turning to that now. And then this other one, which he tweeted somewhere as well, Warning, hell awaits you, repent, only Jesus saves. Then he came out with this one. Since my social media posts were publicized, it has been suggested that I am homophobic and bigoted and that I have a problem with gay people. This could not be further from the truth. I fronted the cover of the Star Observer magazine to show my support for the Bingham Cup, which is an international gay rugby competition for both men and women. I believe in inclusion. In my heart, I know I do, not have any phobia towards anyone. So some people will see that obviously as very conflicting, very conflicting statements. You know, on one hand, they're, they're going to hell. On the other ha hand, I'm happy to embrace people. So these are some of the questions that come from that. What, what was right about Israel's comments? Was there anything you guys see as being right in those comments? Wouldn't they beat around the bush, did he? No. <laughs> so was he untruthful? No. No. So, so he, he was factual, wasn't he? The Bible says sinners go to hell. That's what I'm addressing. Um, what was wrong with what Israel said? Not necessarily factually wrong, but what was, okay, maybe the next one down, what was, what was not necessarily wrong, but, but potentially problematic about what he said? It was blunt. Yeah, it was pretty brutally blunt, wasn't yeah. it? And ungracious. <laughs> yeah, very ungracious. He probably doesn't think it that way. As, this, as an islander, I can, um, you know, some islanders just go straight out there. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a bit like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I can understand yeah. where mm. he's coming from. Yes. Yeah. He's just like, go out out yeah. there, you know. Yeah. Speak Don't, in his mind. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I totally sympathize with that. You know, Dutch people are the same. I was brought up in a culture like that. So you just, you know, my favorite example of this is a, woman who went to my mum and said to her, are you on a diet? And she said, oh, no. And she said, well, you should be. 
<laughs> pretty savage. It was true. Yeah, yeah. My mum will say it was true. She needed to be, but it's pretty blunt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he truth on one hand, we all agree truth, but delivery was... Mm, could have been a bit more sensitive about, oh, I don't know, it, you know. But it was an answer to a direct question. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't think he faltered that. I mean, it, it, yes, it was a bit blunt and probably put it better, but he was asked with his opinion. Yep. He, he should mm. be then able to give it. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I guess I, will, I should say the issue we don't, we're not aiming to go into tonight is whether he's justified in sharing his thoughts and especially around freedom of speech and all that sort of stuff. Like That's a huge topic. We could engage in that one just one night by itself. Um, the reality is freedom of speech means you have the right to say what you think. Um, whether that was done rightly or not is a whole other question. Uh, but So yes, rightly, truthfully spoken, potentially could have said better. Is that how most of us would feel? Yeah. Um, so what do you think he could have done differently? Warren? So you shouldn't mention hell in a public place. Goodness me. <laughs> hey, it's a fair comment. Like to, and that's one fascinating thing that's come out of this is that I saw a post on the Australian Gospel Coalition and they said we shouldn't actually be upset about this because all of a sudden hell, God, Christianity is just commonplace discussion everywhere in Australia now. Everywhere you go, you have the opportunity to talk to people about it. It's all over the media, you know? Um, so yes, mentioning hell is almost like a bullet in the head if you're in any form of public role. Jay? I was going to say, I wonder whether it might, because like, it might have been a better idea to focus on the opportunity that people in that situation have rather than necessarily what awaits them if they don't avail themselves of the opportunity, so, if that makes sense. So like, everybody has the opportunity to go to heaven, mm. but it's whether or not you make that choice. So mm. God's plan, obviously, is that if people accept him and follow him, then they have eternal life. So, mm. you know, because I, I wonder whether, you know, focusing on the positives like that's probably a better way of portraying the situation. Mm. But didn't he say Jesus saves? Yeah, but... Uh, I'm wondering whether he may start with that rather than yeah, start so with I the going to hell. In, in the original comment, he said, hell, yeah, hell unless they repent of their sins and return to God. So I, I guess it, it really is just the bluntness of it, isn't it? Like it just, you feel the edginess of the comment. I think separating out what God's plan is from for gay people uh, against what God's plan is for all people is a bit dangerous, isn't it, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's exactly the same yeah. situation for straight people or, yeah. you know, anyone else. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and he, did, and he, he tried to address that in a future comment. Mm, I, yes, I saw uh, that. Yeah. The, the, I think the... One of the huge problems with the question the lady asked, uh, what is God's plan for homosexuals? Well, God's plan is not for everybody to go to hell. That's what humans have done. We've brought sin upon ourselves, and so we're going to hell. And God actively works in a plan to save people. And we have that offered to us. So, so it's, sometimes you can get questions like this that are just really brutal to engage with. Um, and if you fire off answers, you can get yourself in quite a bit of trouble. Um, Logan, um, the me media can be quite brutal. Oh, yeah. So, you know, who knows why they asked that question originally. You know, they, here they are baiting the guy. Yeah. And so, so the question <laughs> I've got is, do people in high-profile places like that and sports teams have a media consultant yeah, okay. that could give them some advice? Because the guy's just... <coughs> He hasn't handled it right, but he could have had some astute advice from somebody. Yeah. So there's a the overall picture. There's a sense in which he's done some stuff really, really well, and he's done some stuff maybe not so well. Um, so I'm not sure. I think pretty fr pretty quickly, I think he got a team of sort of advisors around him and lawyers and wise people and stuff like that. Um, so what do you think he he shouldn't? What should he not have done? That's a weirdful mouthful. Put his mouth into action, be forfeiting his brain into gear. Mm. <coughs> or or praying, even. Uh, 
I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty hard to figure out what he did before he responded. It could have been that he just instantly sort of whipped out a response. Um, I know we've we've probably all fallen prey to that when you you get an email and you just instantly write a response and it goes horrendously bad. Or, you know, you're standing at the door as the pastor and someone says something to you and you just go Bleh, straight back at them and it ends badly. But usually when you do that, you're responding to someone's emails. Your audience is one. Yeah, true. And, and this is a public mm. of hundreds of thousands of followers. Yeah. Um, so you want to be a little careful. Yes, yeah, so it's an even bigger issue, isn't it? So I guess um, not, resp- not responding instantaneously, praying beforehand. Uh, these are all things we can learn. Uh, sure, we don't have hundreds of thousands of followers. Chloe? Um, I think he could have made what he actually thinks a bit more clear. Because at one point he said that they need to repent, they're going to hell. At another point he said that he includes them. I think he could have made it more obvious about what he actually <coughs> thinks is. Mm. What he actually thinks. Mm. Yeah, and and th- this is a huge thing. It's really challenging when you're on the internet. But it's because in a particular context, with people reading it, with a whole bunch of stuff going on in their own brains, they read it completely different than how I intend it. And some of that's happened as well. So all they see is hell and go homophobic without reading the second line, which says, unless they come to God. So they're not. it's not guaranteed there is hope for them, you know. I think part of the problem is some people like the novelty of being outraged. And that's <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. There is a lot of truth to that. People love being upset and having any reason to get angry at someone about something. Um, and it's probably always been that way, but you did it in your lounge, you know, so you'd watch some politician say something on TV or read it in the newspaper and you'd get angry at the newspaper or the TV or the rugby game, um, the umpire, you know, something. But now it's so fast back and forth all the time that people have the ability to vent themselves constantly in a public format, which is really not something we've experienced for a long time. Um, If you go back to the early church period, it was very common because everyone would go to the marketplace to talk about stuff. So you had the same thing in a bigger reality. Um, So let's see if we can get some biblical help on this. Okay, so Ephesians 5 verse 3 to 5. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And Corinthians, this is the one he referenced, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now, if you take those two verses, and homosexuality is just one tiny little thing, isn't it? No no one asks about the the thieves part. You know? Or any, all the deceivers, the greedy, yeah. (laughs) There's a whole lot of stuff in there, isn't there? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Pretty much everyone's included in that list. Like, there's nobody who hasn't done some of that stuff who is who's alive. Well, Paul specifically applies it to all of us, and such were some of you. He's saying, you guys in the church, this was you guys. So. And that's why sometimes these questions just, they feel so unfair. Because it's like, yeah, but you're just, you're targeting on one thing. So yes, he's right. But it's actually so much bigger than that. It's not just about whether homosexuals, and I think he did try and address that in one of the other posts he made, which I put up there earlier. It was that sense of that all sinners are going that way. This is not just an issue of homosexuality. Um. And this is a really good reminder for us when we deal with 
homosexual people. That on a on a God me level, there's no difference between me and them. They just have a particular sin, and I had particular sins, and the need is the same. This one, I think, really highlights this point better than anything else. This is Jesus speaking in Luke 13. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What's Jesus trying to tell us? So, what would it have sounded like if if Israel replied with that? You know, are homosexuals going to hell? Well, according to Jesus, they're not worse sinners than the liars. Or any of the other people in Jerusalem who the tower didn't fall on. So their only hope is that they repent. And and the and the positive twist that comes from that by Jesus is you know he's just so wise. He takes there's this group blah these bad guys look what happened to them. We're not that bad, but they were really bad. You know that sort of attitude. And Jesus is turning it and saying, look, it's the same reality for all of us. We need to repent. And this is where, so that, that's the truth of it. The truth of it is, yes, homosexuals outside of Christ go to hell. That's what the Bible teaches, just like the liars and the greedy and everyone else. Now, here's the flip side of that. Colossians 4, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Put in your heart's honor, Christ the Lord as holy. Sorry, but in your heart's honor, Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, thinking about those three verses, did you... How much of that did you see in Israel's responses? There was truth. We've said that. Would you describe it as gentleness and respect? Gracious, seasoned with salt, love. But I think the other issue you've got too is that you, you talked about that other thing that he put out. And, yep. and you know, the press were very careful oh, yeah. to make sure that those sorts of ones didn't get the yeah. airing that you know it was when he was blunt that they chose yeah. to oh, share that so it's very much twisted yeah, mm. and and so we do want to acknowledge at this point and that thank you we do want to acknowledge um we don't know everything israel said there's probably a wealth of stuff he said which is filled with graciousness and gentleness and love and it didn't get published um, and I'm sure, because I know one of the things I saw was some when he put up the thing about raising money, someone put up a counter site, and that someone asked him whether he wanted it pulled down, and he said no. And he defended the person's right to do that. And he defended a homosexual person in the media. And so he's actively gone out and done that with people. I'm, I guess I'm sort of more thinking of that first statement that sort of ignited all of this. Because if that first statement hadn't ignited all of this, he wouldn't be where he is. Um, so I just looked at that first tweet and I thought to myself, it, it probably could have done with some seasoning and some salt. It's amazing what just a touch of gentleness does. An example of this, I um, asked... Have any of you guys know Zach Eswine? Yep. So he offered to critique some of my sermons once, which is always a hard thing to go through as a preacher. 
So I sent him one of my sermons and he offered me like this monstrous critique. And it's pretty savage to hear. And about two thirds of the way down, there was a break and he wrote, please don't receive this badly. Read it with a smile on my face because you know I love you. And my whole attitude changed completely. I was reading through it just like beating myself up, feeling like horrible and getting angry against what he was saying. I read that and I was like, oh, all of a sudden everything's been put in context. Yeah, and so that just that touch of gentleness, and I think that's what these guys are getting at. It's amazing what you can deliver to people when, when you do it with graciousness and love. You know, I remember watching John MacArthur on the TV talk show once, and he's pretty he's pretty hard shooting guy, um, and he was asked, "Do homosexual people go to hell?" And he he said, "Yes." Homosexuals go to hell just like every other sinner, but the and he didn't take a breath. But the wonderful news is Jesus Christ died so that all sinners will have eternal life because God loves them so much. And it was like, oh, that hurts, but I feel the balm at the same time, you know. Here's the flip side of, I guess, so you've got truth, you've got love, and you've got wisdom. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What can we learn from that? It's the media. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what do we learn from that? Then? Media are dogs and pigs, sorry. <laughs> what, what does that tell us? Be very careful what you say. Yeah. Sometimes you're better off... Not to say anything. Not to say anything. Imagine if he just didn't answer. If he had just not said anything, this would have blown away with the wind. It would have been one guy's comment. And have you ever had this on Facebook where you like see something and you're like, Rah! and then you stop before you hit enter and you look at it and go, yeah, maybe not, delete. Yeah, I do that all the time. I see something and it, my brain just flicks. And I'm like, I just want to massacre that post. It's so disgusting. And I spew out three paragraphs and I'm just like, this is just a death trap plot. Delete the whole thing. Um, or you get the email, you're like, and then you, you, and what, so what, I write an email, and then I leave it till the morning. And I read it in the morning, I'm like, well, I'm really glad I didn't send that. That's not great. See, that was the difference. In, with snail mail, you yeah, might true. write an email, I mean, a, a normal letter, and then if you, you usually just don't go straight away and post it. True. So it sort of gives you time to think, hmm. Will I send it? Will I not? Yeah. And, but this is so instant mm. that, yeah, probably yeah. better to wait for a while before you send anything, really. Yeah, and I, th I think sometimes I guess the temptation comes from because everything's instant, you feel like you almost have to respond straight away because people are sitting there waiting for a response. And it's probably a lot bigger pressure on him when you've got hundreds of thousands of people following you. And this is, I mean, the reality is nowadays that's part of their career. That's how they become more famous. That's how they get better positions and all that sort of stuff. That's all a part of it. I would just, he should have gone, oh, no, I shouldn't say that, but he should have just gone off it for a few months. Just not gone in. What is it, Twitter or whatever? Yeah, Twitter. Yeah. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. What, what do we learn from that? People are going to flog you. <laughs> what, 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 what input does this give into our discussion? There's a world, and that's the world that we live in. This is not a first century problem only. It may look very different now, but that we're in the same reality. And so Jesus doesn't say, go out um, as sheep and get eaten. Does he? So you are sheep as wolves, so you know, go out and act the sheep and get eaten alive. He says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You know, like, Yes, persecution's inevitable, but that doesn't mean we run around and try and find it. You know, we don't run into a Muslim 
fanatical country and run around with a banner on our back saying, hey, I'm a Christian, please kill me. You know, just, <laughs> we're wise and we're innocent. So I've got five guiding principles that we can talk through and then one law. So, oh, we don't like law. But this is a good law, so it's okay. Five guiding principles. Is this person a Christian or not? So when it comes to engaging with homosexuals for us, this is not Israel, but for us, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is this person is this person claiming to be a Christian or not? Why do you think that would impact how you would interact with a homosexual person? Because they claim to be a Christian, obviously they have to up, you know, uphold a certain standards. Whereas if somebody is clearly a non-believer, <coughs> then obviously it's ridiculous expecting them to live their life as if they're a believer. That would be foolish. Yep. So... Jesus says, a good tree bears what? Good fruit. And a bad tree bears bad fruit. So if a person is claiming to be a good tree, you're within your rights of asking what question? Are you bearing good fruit? Let's have a look at the fruit. The same thing they can do to me. So if I'm claiming to be a good tree and I'm a dirty liar and I sit up here and preach and lie the whole time, Everyone is well within their right to say, wait a second, you're not producing fruit in keeping with righteousness. That's the word of Jesus. Now, how is your response going to vastly differ if the person's a Christian to if the person's a non-Christian? Well, if someone's a Christian, then you're going to tell them what the Bible states, saying that Jesus said not to, not that this isn't right. And if you truly are a believer, then you're not. Then you shouldn't do this. Yeah. Whereas if they're not a Christian, then they're not going to really care about what the Bible says, and it's probably not a good idea to open the Bible because they're just going to say, "Yeah, but that might not be true." Yep. So, I mostly agree. The we always want to open the Bible anyway, but I understand where you're going. Um, what does the person need to hear? The two different people. What's the difference? What's the person? Okay, let's put it this way. I'm a homosexual. I come to you and I ask you, what do you think about homosexuals? And let's have a conversation. What do I need to hear? Do I need to hear uh, how I need to live? What do I need to hear? The, the gospel. So because whether a person is a liar, what did we see? Liar, greedy, homosexual, all the other things, adulterer, all the other things. The need's the same, isn't it? Their need is exactly the same. So whether you're talking to the 80-year-old, lovely little old grand lady on the side of the road who seems to do almost everything right in her life, or you're talking to the male prostitute, their need is exactly the same, isn't it? So you can spend all your time telling the little old lady that she needs to stop watching, God, no. I was going to say Coronation Street, but someone here might have watched Coronation Street. <laughs> um, well, I can't think of what a little old grandma would do naughty. Maybe she covets the other old grandma across the road and she wants the other old grandma's Mercedes Benz. You could tell her she needs to not cover. Mobile scooter. I think. Mobile scooter, yeah. You know, she's really, she's really coveting the other lady's Scooter. Souped up model. Souped up model that goes 4Ks instead of 2Ks an hour. And, and so she's a sinner because she's coveting. And she deserves to go to hell because she's a sinner. So what good, is, what good does it do to that lady if you come up to her and tell her she needs to stop coveting? It doesn't help her, does it? Just like it, it doesn't help. So my mum's cousin is a homosexual. It does no good to him if I go to him and tell him he needs to stop being a homosexual. What difference does that make in eternity? Robert? Logan, I was thinking that maybe a step before the guy needs the gospel, sure he needs the gospel, but is he going to listen to the gospel from me? So maybe a step is how do you actually get to the stage of sharing the gospel? Because it's got to be done in love. Yeah. 
So there's got to be some acceptance and non-judgmentalness going on there. And there's got to be a personal relationship. Or you, you build a personal relationship yeah. with the guy. Yeah. And then he's not going to give you a hard time necessarily. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I agree 100%. I guess I'm assuming that you're in a place where you can do that. Um, I mean, talking to someone about the gospel, it's not a two-minute thing. It's a relationship thing. Um, I guess the thing I'm trying to get to with this is you have to know who, who you're interacting with. Because if, interact, if you're interacting with a person who claims to be a Christian and they're living in sin, you have to address a completely different thing. So I'm just, for example, as a pastor, if, I, if there's a person in our church who is struggling with that sin and they're saying, I am a believer, I love Jesus, then I need to address their sin. Just like if one of you guys is struggling with spending way too much money on yourself in the grossest selfish way possible. I need to address that. Why? Because I want you to become more like Jesus Christ. But if you're not a believer, that's a waste of my time. Because you need to hear about Jesus Christ. Um, so the first, first guiding principle, is the person a Christian or not? Because that's going to dictate your response. The majority of people you talk to in this situation are going to be in the non-Christian category. There are some. Um, there's a really, if you want to watch a really interesting documentary from the other perspective, look up uh, Time for Love. It's a New Zealand documentary from a bunch of New Zealand scholars claiming that homosexuality is okay as Christian. Very interesting. It gives you, shows you what the other perspective looks like. Time for Love. Um, if anyone needs some helpful critiquing comments, I wrote a whole bunch uh, in response to it. It's not hugely long, and I didn't put them on social media. Um, <laughs> they they might, not, might not have gone down too well. Um, so the second guiding principle is truth with love. Why is that important? People don't hear the truth if, if, if it's not done in a loving and gracious way. Hmm. They just reject, reject it out loud. Yeah, people reject it if it doesn't come with love. Chloe? I don't want to do what Israel did by just doing it with a, a blunt edge because it makes the cut a whole lot more sore and I think they wouldn't really want to listen to you if you just said it in a blunt sort of way without any sort of love. Yep. What about the other end of the spectrum? I mean, you could tell people what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Love, not going to help them. love without truth. I mean, some of us, our propensity is towards truth without love. That, that's my leaning. Siapo's already said that's her leaning, is to just say what you think. Others of you will lean the other way, and you're not going to want to offend people, so you're just not going to say it. And when those two powers combine, it ends up in arguments. But, <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, I have a friend at work. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's a he. Yeah. Anyway, he talked to me the other day and he says, Sia Paul, what do you think if I tell you that I'm attracted to guys? And I said to him, why would you do that? And wait, then... Wait, sorry, why would you tell me or why would you Why would you, why would you attract it to, okay, to me? Yeah. Why would you attract it to me? Yeah. And they say, oh, I think I was meant to be born mm. like um, a girl but I'm stuck with this so anyway I don't know how I got into this conversation it says do you believe do you read the Bible and he said yes and say what do you believe how God created Eve and Adam not even it's Eve and Steve and he goes oh I had I heard so many stories like that and I said but it's true um the Bible said you know, he created Adam, and then Adam, God was not happy to be, have Adam by himself, so he mm. created a woman. So that's why we got, yeah. you know, a woman and men. So I think you should read the Bible to understand mm. why God made you as a boy, mm. because you're meant to be a boy, not a girl. 
Yeah, it's wonderful. So why, why is that good? What's the upper just shared? Because she's not attacking the person. She's, you're separating the person from the issue and you're saying, you know, we've got a relationship together, we work together, I'm not going to be upset at you, but have you thought about this? What does the Bible say? And so it's not what, what do I think? You know, what does Israel think about this issue? Well, it's not about what I think. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that men were made good. Well, men and women were made good for each other. And it was beautiful. And we messed it up. You know? So truth with love has to be hand in hand. As soon as we jettison one or the other, you no longer do what you need to do. And I think for Kiwis, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but for Kiwis, the default problem is love without truth because we don't want to upset people. And it's really scary to say the hard thing. On um, Talkback Radio, I'm hearing more and more of the host saying, well, we won't go down that rabbit hole. And they move the conversation away from it yep. rather than get involved in discussing the truth. Yeah. <clears throat> But um, I thought about what Siapo said, and I thought it was good that that guy had, knew his Bible and was reading his Bible, right? Mm. But the thing is, there's so many people now, much more percentage of people now, that don't know the Bible. They True. don't know anything. And it makes it, you've got a lot of ground to, um, yeah, to cover before yeah. you can... Get down, you know, get down to it. Like, yeah, so, but it was good that that guy mm. read his Bible, mm. so, like, Siapo could say that to go back to it. So, you know, I think that was, yep. that was easy because he did read his Bible and he yeah. didn't know his Bible. So, so what's one way you might deal with that problem? Someone at your workplace comes up and talks to you and you say to them, why have you read what the Bible says about it? No, nah, I've never opened it before in my life. Give them one of those copies of the Gospel of John. Yep, so that would be one way. What's another way? Do you want to go out for a cup of coffee sometime and have a look? Yeah, you know, I tell you what, especially I, nowadays people are a lot more open to the idea. Because you know, we've sort of moved past as a majority, we've moved past that stage of, I went to Sunday school as a kid and I don't want anything to do with anything spiritual. People are generally interested in having a discussion about stuff. You're still going to meet some that aren't. But sometimes it's just, well, yeah, she'll go out for a cup of coffee and we'll, one time and we'll just open up the Bible and have a look what God says about the idea. And you offer them the opportunity to critique it because if anything, it's going to get them reading the Bible anyway. Um. So inviting them into a relationship as well. Um, giving them a gospel of John is great as well. Giving them a Bible is great as well. But the, and the other thing you can do is, you know, take a gospel of John, read it, tell me what you think, and we'll have another chat about it. Um, but ongoing conversation is good. Uh, motivation, third guiding principle, motivation is huge. Why is motivation important? Not motivation to do it, but your own motivation. If you're doing it because you care about the person and you want them to come to know Jesus, that's one thing. Yep. But if you just want to prove yourself to be right and then wrong, um, it's, not, it's not showing love at all. Yep, being wrong. Um, it has to come from love in your heart and, and wanting yeah. that person to be saved. Yep. So why, why, would, why do you share the gospel with your lovely grandmother? Why do you do it? Because you want to see her in heaven. Yeah. Because you... So when, when my grandmother died, she was a non-Christian. When she died, the last thing my mother did, when she went in about 15 minutes before she finally died, my mother went in there and she just took this last chance to talk to her about Jesus one more time. Just, just I have to do it. And she said, look, mum, you're not going to like me talking to you about this, but I'm going to talk to you about it anyway. And she tried one more time. And she tried one more time and she just it until she died. Because we don't want to see them go to hell. That must be our motivation. Even when we're talking to the most, just speaking plainly, the grossest person you can imagine. And so 
one example of a group doing this well. In Cambodia, we went to this little cafe and the cafe is staffed 100% by males and they're all ex-male prostitutes. So the cafe goes out, finds male prostitutes on the street, to, picks them up, takes them home, gives them jobs and teaches them about Jesus Christ. I mean, th these guys... They're not the sort of dudes you want to meet on the side of the road. Like you can imagine. It's like going down K Road at three in the morning. You go down the little side streets. They're not the sort of people you want to meet on, you know, to go for a stroll down K Road. But you know, is the thing motivating me when I'm engaging with a homosexual or a person asking me about it, is the thing that is generating my heart an overwhelming passion to see this person saved? Because if it's not, I probably shouldn't engage, to be totally honest. Sometimes wisdom remains silent. How do we feel about that? We're just sort of quite really. <laughs> Everyone remains not, silent. Not being cowardly about it, but no. sometimes you have to make your fights. Yeah. So I, I was going to look it up, but I forgot. There's two proverbs beautifully placed, one straight after the other one. And the first one says, Answer a fool in his folly, or he will think himself wise. And the next proverb says, do not answer a fool in his folly, lest he think himself wise. You think that's contradiction? No, they're two very important proverbs. Sometimes you need to answer a fool in his folly. Sometimes you just, it's not worth it. It's like throwing pearls before a swine, you know. Some, some emails aren't worth answering. Some social media posts are just worth scrolling past. Um, choose the right format for discussion. What do we think about that? I think you've got the right idea, but coffee is good. <laughs> what was that? Coffee is good. Yeah, coffee is good. <laughs> Honestly, like, like if, if you're wanting to have a serious discussion with someone and you've got legitimate, I guess, legit reasons for it rather than just, you know, wanting to prove that you're right or whatever, realistically, it's probably better done face to face. Because yeah. like the thing is, there's so many things that can be misconstrued mm. by our email yeah. mm. or via written communication. Well, if you've got genuine love for a person, you don't want to embarrass them. Yeah, true. You don't want to put them in the, in, in the spotlight. So you, you're going to have, if it's a sense of mission, you probably want to take them aside. Yeah, that's a really good point. Publicly shaming a person is pretty brutal to a relationship. Yeah, I mean, can you just... Just imagine on Facebook, someone puts something up about their new boyfriend and, and you respond with all the love in your heart and care and concern that they're going to go to hell and you tell them that being a homosexual is sort of like a ticket to hell and they need to believe in Jesus. So publicly, you may be right, but it's just the wrong setting, isn't it? Or as you think, Siapo, you're, you're at work, but you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person. You know, that's healthy. That's good. You're right here and I can look at your face and I can see what it's doing and I can see the tenderness in your face. You don't get that in text. But if you're on the other side of the world or the other side of Auckland or wherever you are and you read that, you read it with your own frame of mind, don't you? And so you can project stuff onto other people. Um, and I've had this with Josella where someone sent me an email and I read it and I'm like, whoa, I'm feeling really cut up. I'm like, I can't believe the person said it like that. And I'll, and I'll go, honey, can you read this? And just, I can, just tell me this. And she'll read it. And she's like, oh, that's not how I heard it at all. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, no, the person just means this, this. And I'm like, oh, oh, that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. That's exactly how I found about Israel Speaks when he put mm -hmm. it on there. Just straight up. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Because, um, yeah, if you hear lots of uh, islander preachers, yeah. <laughs> they just straight up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <It's laughs> they don't, yeah, they don't think before mm. they say. Yeah. And, and so my personal opinion is just anything serious, honestly, don't touch it with a barge pole on social media. It's just not worth it. And the reality is it's probably not going to do much good anyway. I mean, you, a bunch of people who already agree with you are going to say amen. And all the people that don't agree with you are going to say, oh, I don't like you, you know. And, and look, there are some people who do social media really well. 
and give responses to these sorts of issues extremely well. And I think there is a place for that. I'm Personally, I'm just not going to enter into it. Because it's not, I don't think it's something I'm particularly good at delivering in text. Um, so I think, look, if, if you're good at it, by all means, I, to be honest, I think it's just really risky. Because uh, stuff can be misconstrued in text very, very easily. I mean, we can get misconstrued in just our speech, let alone on a text without a face face impression in front of it. I say stuff up. I say stuff up here, and people hear me completely different all the time and ask me about it afterwards. You know, it's like <laughs> okay. So those are our five guiding principles to think through. Um, sort of have them running through your heads, and we have our have what I call our one law. Is my response to X? So you can enter whatever social issue, whatever issue around the place is. Is my response God-glorifying, Christ-centered, spirit-soaked, and biblically based? With perfect alliteration. Let me just, just appreciate the alliteration for a moment. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> no. Honestly, if, if that summarizes your response, is it going to go well? Well, it might still go horribly. But you're going to be faithful to God. You know, if my, my intention is that God would be glorified and I'm doing it in a way that Christ stays completely centered in all of my motives and I'm, and this, and I'm, in tr I'm relying upon the Spirit of God to soak me so that I might faithfully do it and I'm answering biblically blessed, look, the world can hate me for what I say, but I've been faithful to God. And so that's why I've called out that our one law. But God knows your heart. Yes. Even if other people don't have got mis, um, <clears throat> misunderstood or something. Yes. God knows your motive and your heart. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's right. And so sometimes you can do everything right and the world will still crucify you. That was the story of the early church. What did they do? They were faithful citizens. One, one apologist wrote, to the emperor of Rome and said to him, if you carry on going the way you're going, you will kill most of your citizens and they will be all of your best ones. Because they were faithful citizens who didn't steal and took care of children on the side of the road and did everything loving and sought to be faithful business people and they were crucified for it. And, and it, look, the reality is that will happen to us. But I guess it's the, the dove and serpent thing. That, let's not give them reason to crucify us. I think, is it Peter? Maybe it's Peter, it might be someone else, who says, um, we rejoice in suffering when we suffer for doing good, not when we suffer for doing bad. That's not honorable, you know. When I get disciplined by my teacher at school, yeah, I'm suffering for Jesus. Yeah, if it worked that way, I suffered for Jesus a whole lot when I was at school, and it just didn't work like that. <laughs> so this is our one law that controls us through. And ultimately, Catherine's right. It's a it's a thing of the heart, isn't it? Like, what's our heart issue behind it all? And I tell you, I've actually been really impressed in general with how Israel's handled himself. Yeah, okay, the initial spark wasn't great, but I tell you, this is the wonderful thing about the sovereignty of God. Because in all of this, God's name is being talked about everywhere. And we have an open platform. We shouldn't be discouraged by this. We should be encouraged because it's given us amazing opportunities. And if anything, there's a chance that this really locks in religious freedom for Australia for a long time. By the time this is finished. Because it's raised a pretty big issue of what does religious freedom actually look like. Um, which has to be wrestled with. So... Some really good stuff. Well, good stuff always comes from it because God's at work. Um, and if anything else, it might be that through this action, people might come to know Jesus Christ. Who knows? Well, our time is done. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we do just give thanks to you for Israel Falau. Lord, we... Thank you that he loves Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we acknowledge along with everybody that we are all sinners. We are all broken. We all get things wrong. 
Lord, if, if he has acted unwisely, we pray that you would forgive him. We praise you for the things that he has done well. We pray that you would continue to use him so that your name would be glorified. We pray for ourselves and we ask that you would give us much wisdom in these regards. That, that you would help us to love our neighbors. That you would help us to really focus upon glorifying God and remaining centered upon Christ and being soaked in the spirit and being biblically based. That Lord generated by love for our neighbors, we would tell them about Jesus Christ. Would you give us much wisdom in this regard? Would you help us to grow in this way? That we might enter into hard conversations to the, to the salvation of souls. Thank you for our time together. Would you keep us safe as we depart from here now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.